Thank you all for coming on a Friday morning here in November in New York City. Uh, we've all experienced directly and indirectly a devastating act of Mother Nature. Hurricane Sandy uh, brought unprecedented damage to the New York, New Jersey, and Northeast region. And uh, today's Road to Recovery is an attempt to help create awareness and understanding for those impacted by the storm as to how to recover and move ahead successfully from it. Uh, we experienced a program and a disaster like this several years ago when Katrina hit the Gulf Coast. And some of our speakers today will bring testimony and uh, eyewitness to that experience with the hope that we'll learn and move forward from what they've gone through uh, and act as a, a resource for us to think about how we individually and collectively get through the storm. I want to bring personal regards from our chairman, Stan Bergman, who would love to have been here with us today uh, and is 150% behind this morning's, uh, today's program. Um, Stan, unfortunately, is in Europe uh, attending a Congress and was unable to be here. But on behalf of Team Shine, um, our medical, our dental, and our animal health businesses, uh, we appreciate your participation with us. Uh, we're also fortunate to have the presence of so many health professional associations, both on the national, the state, and the county levels. And we wanted to thank all of them for being here today and lending their support, not only in bringing members of theirs to today's meeting, but also helping us prepare the program, participate on the program, and most importantly, to disseminate today's uh, information to their membership uh, for the future. There are hundreds and hundreds of practices that have been impacted in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Many of them with total disaster, some partially, and almost all have had patient interruption uh, issues that they are facing uh, in terms of uh, getting back to economic stability and, and running the practice as it was prior to Sandy hitting the shores. Um, today's program is talking about resources that are available in that recovery, positioning and, and resiliency by each individual who was impacted by the storm in terms of identifying where do you go from here, and then, of course, recovery. And although recovery will not be instant and it will not be a snapping of your finger and, and clicking your shoes and your back in Kansas, it will be an opportunity to, as you'll learn this afternoon, if you have a plan, if you have a direction, if you know who you can count on, you can get through it. And there are lots of people interested in seeing that happen for all of you. Um, I'd like to thank all of my colleagues at Team Shine from our medical, dental, and animal health businesses, from our creative services group, our corporate communication group, and my own team of Loretta Mercado and Kim Craig who have really uh, helped put this program together. It was conceptualized Tuesday morning, the day that Sandy hit the New York, New Jersey area. And in the last 13 days, we've strove to recruit the best speakers, to provide a valuable program for each of you today, and we hope that it meets your needs. Thank you. Have a great, meaningful day. The first speaker for today's program is the president of the American Dental Association Foundation, Dr. David Whiston. Dave, thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you all very much. Uh, when uh, Dr. Bob Fiella contacted me early this week uh, to ask if uh, I would represent the dental profession, and obviously, I think all of us involved um, in this situation understood that it was an opportunity for us and I say for us, for the dental community, to uh, better focus on how we could help uh, many of you, those impacted by the tragic circumstances that occurred here in the northeast part of the country. Also for us, uh, I think we saw this as an opportunity to encourage others to be involved, and the best way to do that, I feel, is to associate ourselves, our organizations, with other organizations and leaders, such as Team Shine, uh, Stanley Bergman, uh, Gerard Mushner, and certainly Steve Kess. Those of you who know Steve Kess, I know many of you in the room do, 
know that Steve has a unique ability to understand difficulties, understand problems, the subtleties, the uh, details that those problems may involve. But also, he knows how to quickly identify solutions and then direct those solutions toward the problem so he can attack the problems. Probably most importantly, though, is his ability to discern the, the direct path toward the solutions. I think all of us in our daily lives uh, get uh, bogged down in some of the circuitous activities that bureaucracies that we deal with uh, foist upon us. And uh, through the leadership of, of many uh, like Steve, uh, we're able to, uh, we'll be able to cut straight to some solutions. The, uh, like the other organizations uh, represented here today, and certainly many who are not, uh, the dental profession uh, has uh, uh, a long, really great history of helping those in need, colleagues, families, uh, friends, and others in need. And I think the big uh, lesson that we've learned, especially early on in this situation, is that uh, there, it, it has to be an all hands on deck, team collaborative effort. I think we all understand that we can't, as uh, volunteer leaders, for example, uh, delegate staff to perform these tasks and, and, and carry on. Um, we, I think we all understand that it has to be this combination. In our situation, starting with Dr. Fiala's team, ADA leadership in Chicago, and certainly all of us at the ADA Foundation, also based in Chicago, but, and as many of you know, the ADA is blessed with a so-called tripartite arrangement. It's the American Dental Association, then the regional constituent groups, then the component groups, the local groups. Well, the interaction among these groups in the past couple weeks has been, has been daily at some level. And the, uh, you know, what we've, again, uh, it's been graphically demonstrated uh, in this instance is that this volunteer staff collaboration is absolutely crucial, absolutely crucial. So again, whether it's uh, ADA, ADA Foundation, New York State Dental, uh, Dr. Feldman, no one understands that collaborative effort more than he does because he's transitioned not long ago from the volunteer side to the staff side. New Jersey, certainly, and then down to the components. Uh, Staten Island, Queens, uh, Long Island, the Jersey Shore. Uh, all, all of these people, all of these organizations involved at a structural level. In fact, one of the best notes that I saw came from uh, Art Mizell in, in, uh, in uh, New Jersey. He, uh, in a note that Art sent, he said that in the day or two after the storm, that his organization, and I'll use that term loosely, had contacted nearly 500 dentists and family directly. And he said those contacts were made by staff and board members. So again, all hands on deck, all hands on deck. And as volunteers in uh, initiatives like this, I think, um, we again graphically understand that you, you must have a strong, expert, and committed staff to make these things work. Policy is the easy part. Implementation, talk about it, that's, that's a tough part. That's where the Steve Kessens of the world come in. And for us, on the, on the staff side, let me just, and, and during the day today, we'll get a chance to uh, uh, formalize some of these contacts. But let's, let's start by talking about the American Dental Association. Dr. Kathleen O'Loughlin is the executive director there. And the lead person at the ADA in this effort is Joe Martin in uh, member services. Uh, that's Martin J, M-A-R-T-I-N-J, at ADA.org. At the foundation, uh, Gene Worth. He's the executive director of the foundation. I'll give you his address also. It's Worth, W-U-R-T-H-G, at ADA.org. And then we get to the um, constituent groups, the state groups, New York State Dental Association, M. Feldman, 
F-E-L-D-M-A-N, at nysdental.org. In New Jersey, Art Mizell, Art's the exec there, A-M-E-I-S-E-L, at njda.org. So these contacts, these are people that are ready to hear from you, and they're, it, it's, it would be their privilege to address issues that you bring to them. Again, I think that uh, when we think of, in particular, the ADA Foundation, I think historically you may think of uh, things that that particular foundation has done to address chronic need, give kids a smile, missions of mercy, that sort of thing. But we also have a long history of addressing acute need. In fact, the ADA Foundation uh, was born out of the San Francisco earthquake well over 100 years ago. Uh, in the aftermath of that earthquake, that's when the ADA Foundation started, they uh, were able to help a lot of people, had a little bit of uh, money left over and started this foundation. Since then, certainly we've responded to Katrina, uh, Tuscaloosa, Joplin, tornadoes. Um, in fact, that's another good point. Some of you may just need someone to talk to. Uh, and when I think of New Orleans, and, and again, you can get these contacts through uh, Joe Martin. So again, Martin J at ADA.org. But uh, Bob Barsley in Louisiana, for example. Uh, Lou Powell, Mississippi Gulf Coast. Hiram Johnson in Tuscaloosa. Charlie McGinty in Joplin, Missouri. So these are people who have been through I don't want to say exactly what you've been through because the situation is not always analogous, but they've been through some very, very difficult times. We've seen pictures of their offices, their homes, which are, were then concrete slabs, period. Uh, so uh, there, there are people who, to some extent, understand the, the tragic nature of the situation that you find yourselves in, in this area of the country, and people who certainly are very willing to help in any way possible. And let's talk about that just for a minute. Let's get to, to bottom line issues. The ADA Foundation for some time has had uh, disaster relief grants available. And because of the nature, in fact, Bud and I were talking about this early, earlier, the nature of the 501c3 we're uh, committed to certain uh, processes uh, regarding those applications, uh, various attestations, uh, financial records, you know, that sort of thing. And those are $5,000 grants from the ADA Foundation. We obviously, we all try to evolve in these situations. And we talked about that earlier, the, the evolution uh, from Katrina to Sandy, the changes. Well, part of our uh, evolving in this, in this situation is that uh, approximately two weeks ago, as Steve Kess mentioned, uh, we had all hands on deck. And uh, again, daily communication, Chicago, uh, New York, New Jersey, um, in your areas here. And we quickly found that what we needed was an emergency grant for food and shelter. Uh, as Steve Kess mentioned earlier, uh, you know, what are the basic necessities that hit after an emergency like this? Well, it's food, it's a hot shower, it's gasoline, so food and shelter. So we now have these $1,000 emergency grants. Our target turnaround time is 48 hours. But if you think about that, uh, the, you know, what's in place now, the ADA Foundation the emergency $1,000 grant, the quick turnaround time, uh, uh, the need is there, it, it, the check is out the door. The more structured, uh, more precise $5,000 grant that we talked about, it's been in place for some time and remains in place. And then if you think about that, well, there's a pretty big void over here. I mean, you've got the, the disaster, you've got some insurance coverage, and there's a pretty huge void below that. And that's where New York is trying to gear up under Mark Feldman's leadership to, um, and others, I'm sure also in New Jersey, to establish uh, a mechanism 
where perhaps they can step into that void. You know, again, not talking about uh, making someone whole for their, their losses, but at least step into that sub-insurance, but above traditional uh, $5,000 uh, grant uh, void. So that's a quick sketch of the bottom line, and I will say that uh, of all these things we talk about, when you, talk, when you start talking about uh, the bottom line, what it really means to those affected by disaster, well, the obvious rate limiting factor in all this is donated dollars. You know, that, that's the obvious, obviously the rate limiting factor. Uh, we've had dentists step up from there around the country. The Massachusetts Dental Society just yesterday afternoon uh, stepped up and, and showed their leadership in a substantial way. But we hope that today's event, not just at the, with the audience here certainly, but we hope that today's event through the outreach allows us then to encourage others to, um, to show their concern and their feelings really for those affected by the tragic events uh, following Hurricane Sandy. There are a lot of people and a lot of organizations who are, while certainly extremely saddened by the circumstances that bring us here today, are, and happy maybe is not the best word, but certainly honored, privileged to, uh, to help in any way possible. And we hope that by encouraging others to step up, that will allow us, for example, as an ADA foundation, to help many more that need our help. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker, Dr. Klein, from the American Veterinary Medical Association, has some remarks. All of the speaker's biographies are in your package, so I'm not going into any extensive introductions, but everyone's background and bio is there. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, just to echo the comments from Dr. Whiston, uh, I'm also very honored uh, to be here amongst you um, on behalf of the American Veterinary Medical Association. And for those veterinarians in the audience, hello. Uh, for the rest of you, I hope that what I'm going to be talking about is also relevant, because it's about the basic principles of not only disaster preparedness and response, but obviously about recovery. Um, certainly on behalf of AVMA, I do offer my condolences to all of you who have been impacted by the storm, by Hurricane Sandy, and hopefully what I will present to you today and what you can reference later will be some good guidance to help you swiftly recover and get back to business. Again, on behalf of AVMA, I'm, I'm really delighted to be here, and I do hope that I can provide a little bit of information for you. Um, my quick background is I am a veterinarian, and I am a team commander for the veterinary medical assistance teams those, if you are familiar with those, are sponsored by AVMA to go out and help in disaster preparedness and response. Some of my team members have been working actually on an oil spill in New Jersey that was a consequence of the storm where a lot of birds were oiled. A lot of other team members have been in New York as well recently to help with some of the pet shelters. So I just wanted to give you a quick outline, um, pretty much just basically why we're we even preparing for disasters. and. You know, it is about people, it is about animals um, in, in my line of work, and also just talk a little bit about the whole concept of preparedness, response, and recovery. It really, it's about you first, and it's about your family, and then about your clients and your business, but it's also about your community. And hopefully I can encourage you in the future to get involved and also give you some resources. So why do we need to prepare? Well, we do know that Basically, a lack of planning can increase the magnitude of a disaster. Um, various statistics are out there, I'm just quoting one of them, that basically 43% of businesses that have experienced a disaster without an emergency plan never reopen. Planning in the downtime really does allow for the mitigation of a disaster. It saves lives and obviously it saves expenses. And the, the impact of having a plan could actually prevent the suffering and the loss of life for both animals and people. What do we know about disasters? We all know, and I am one of them, quite frankly, that people wait too long to evacuate. You know, what is that actual 
trigger? What is that moment that says, I really need to go now? Do you wait for the emergency sirens coming down your neighborhood, or do you, in the sense of predicted weather events, try to get out ahead of time? At least 25% of the people will refuse to evacuate and leave pets behind. I, again, am one of them. I have three cats, one macaw, and a Russian tortoise and turtle, and it's going to be really hard to get them all into the car at one time. It is also the logistics of evacuating with multiple pets, just as I explained. I have actually practiced that a couple of times to see how fast I could get three somewhat cooperative cats in the pet carriers and the macaw, and the turtle was easy. The turtle didn't really give me too much trouble. But I, I timed it, and quite frankly, if I had a tornado coming barreling down, I could not get them all out within the five-minute window that I probably would be given. That's kind of scary, but I have to keep practicing to make sure that my cats are a little bit more obedient the next time. So 50 to 70% of people will actually try to re-enter the area if they've left their pets behind for whatever reason. If they were at work when the disaster happened and they just couldn't get home in time, believe me, I am going to be in that lineup of traffic trying to get back to get my pets, or probably speeding around the traffic more than likely. So what do we mean by disaster preparedness? We, we talk about four stages. We talk about the mitigation, the planning that's really, really essential. And I know that we're really at the back end of the story right now, but let's start also thinking for the future. We need to start planning. We need to obviously be prepared, and that usually involves a lot of training and exercising. We also need to think about the response. Who's going to come and help us if we can't help ourselves? And also the recovery, which obviously is the part of the story that we're working through right now. Just as a reminder, um, and it has already been mentioned about Katrina, Katrina was really a life-altering moment for many, many people. Some of us have been to previous disasters. I deployed to the uh, United Kingdom for the foot and mouth disease event back in 2001. I've deployed to other hurricanes along the way, but Katrina was that moment in time that everybody woke up. It woke up from the veterinary profession in particular and also, quite frankly, from the government to realize that people will not leave without their pets. And there's a lot of other you know, issues that came out of Katrina as well, as we talked about this morning you know, in other medical professions. But one of the outcomes of Katrina was what we call the Pets Act. This is federal law. This is the Pets Evacuation and Transportation Standard Act that was implemented in 2006, which basically says that states and local emergency agencies must, must take care of people and their pets. They must provide emergency shelters for people, co-friendly pet shelters, um, pet-friendly hotels, et cetera. It's law in a national emergency. And the veterinarians have really stepped up to the plate, particularly those in private practice who have oftentimes sheltered some of those animals when people had to evacuate. So let's, how do you get started? Let's just talk about that. Well, first, what is it about the disaster? How does it affect you? There is a saying in the emergency response community, don't become part of the problem, okay? You take care of yourself first, and then you take care of everybody else. So first, how do the disasters affect you? Then how can you help your family? That's the next important piece of the puzzle. Your family, your local community, then your staff, your practice, your clinic, um, your clients as well. I mean, hopefully you're guiding them ahead of time about getting um, emergency kits ready to evacuate and having little, you know, go packs for their pets. And then where do you fit into the community? Because quite frankly, whether you're in the medical, dental, or veterinary profession, you are a key member of your community and they look to you for guidance. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, again, a number of websites that are good reference for you, at least on the veterinary side, too, is the AVMA has a lot of information. We've built that up over the recent years, certainly since Katrina, but even before that. The veterinary medical assistance teams have been around for 20 years, and we'll be celebrating that anniversary this coming uh, 2013. But look to avma.org. There's a lot of information on there about disaster preparedness. Um, I think there's some booklets that just arrived in time this morning. One of them is about saving the whole family. So as a veterinarian, please give that information out to your clients. They can also get that information directly from the website. The other products that are listed here are free downloads from the website about uh, veterinary practices and the things that you need to think about in setting up your disaster plans. It may just be a local disaster. Maybe it's a fire in your practice. It doesn't have to be an entire community. It could be just you. So all of those things. FEMA, of course, has a lot of information both on planning and on response. And then don't forget the Red Cross. There's a lot of good collaboration between the veterinary medical community um, or the animal community and the Red Cross to help build those co-located shelters for people and pets. Also, for those of you in, in 
practice, OSHA. You already know that you have certain OSHA guidelines. Well, OSHA is also there with good information about planning and um, preparedness for disasters. Personal preparedness, again, take care of yourself. What's your own evacuation plan? If you're at work and the rest of your family's at home, do you have a rendezvous point? Do you have a way to contact each other if you're separated? List of emergency contacts. How about if it's just you and you're not home, do you have a neighbor who can go get your pets for you if you can't get there? So think about all those things. Again, think about yourself and your family first. Get everything organized. Have the go pack for your pets. I do. I put one together. I have the non-perishable items in a separate bag. So if I have to grab something really quickly, whether it's leashes and bowls and medical records for my pets, because if you're somewhere else and you need to prove that your pets were vaccinated, have that information available. What about your facility? And then this is really general. So for those of you who are not veterinarians, welcome to our world. <laughs> we like to share. Um, but for your general facility, what about the disaster plan? Uh, actually, OSHA does require for facilities that have 10 or more employees, you must have a contingency plan or a CONOPS plan. You must think about those things ahead. Um, all of the issues that you would be involved in as far as having off-site medical records, um, medical record backup, um, having your own employees have their own disaster response plans, and the pet owners, again, look to the veterinary community for guidance. So we want to lessen the overall impact of the disaster on your facility. So why don't you create a disaster planning team, okay? And I know that we're sort of in the downside and the horrible tragedies of what just happened, but we all need to move forward. So let's have a disaster planning team. Involve your employees in the planning process. Divide and conquer. Divide all the different categories and uh, teams into smaller subunits. Have um, a practice in evacuating of your clinic. Have an office phone tree. It's important for employee identification. Let's say you're trying to get back into your facility after the fact and you've got to have probably law enforcement or other security uh, forces in there, make sure that your employees have identification that legitimizes them so they can get back into the facility. How about having them um, trained for CPR and first aid or even hazmat? That's really an investment in your employees so that they can help in a crisis. Um, so remember, your facility also should be part of the larger community plan. So here's just a quick little chart of all the different categories, and it's probably not exhaustive, but some of the top issues that you need to address. Obviously, mitigation, in other words, the planning. How are you going to try to prevent as much damage as possible? Um, training for your employees. Insurance is obviously a big issue. Um, client education, as I talked about with some of the brochures that I um, brought available for you. Emergency supplies. If you think about it, if it's just a power outage or a snowstorm, maybe you need to have like five to seven days worth of food and supplies to keep, in this case, to keep your pets or the animals in your clinic. And how about somebody who's going to stay there and be able to take care of the animals, so having food and supplies for somebody who's going to stay on site? Um, as far as damage assessment and documentation. How about the evacuation and transportation of the animals in your facility? A lot of the animal shelters over the recent years have learned lessons. Actually, mostly Florida was kind of the prototype. Florida learned their lesson a long time ago. Every year, there are hurricanes. So the animal shelter community throughout much of Florida actually works together in a coalition. It's no surprise that Doppler 9000 is telling you that the hurricane is coming, right? It, whatever trajectory it has. What the animal shelter community does is they organize and they'll empty out certain animal shelters that are usually in the direct track to the storm. They'll move those animals to another animal shelter. Not only does it keep those animals safe, but it then opens up that shelter to deal with any displaced pets after that particular storm. So there needs to be coordination. So as far as evacuation and transportation of animals in your clinic, prearrange animal transportation. Believe me that there are going to be a shortage of resources in a disaster. I'm sure you're all realizing that. If you can contract with maybe a commercial bus company or a commercial trucking company that when you push the hotline button and you need somebody to show up with a small van to help evacuate and transport your pets, they are there for you. You're not calling them in the yellow pages the day that it happens because somebody else already did. Okay, so plan to minimize the stress to the animals and try to get them relocated as quickly as possible. 
um, establish sister facilities. I suppose that would also work with the medical and dental profession if you're trying to actually create an alternate operating site until you get back to normal and have reciprocal agreements. So maybe you might be able to um, work out a, a cost-pay situation where you can practice out of your sister facility and see your patients and your clients out of somebody else's facility during that downtime, your downtime, and you can reciprocate that in another, another situation when they were affected. And also, if you're transporting these animals or relocating them, obviously you need to keep an accountability for them during the transport process. Maintain animal ID and records. I hope everybody's got off-site record keeping and backup systems, even just under normal business operations. You don't want to lose those medical records, obviously. Again, competition for resources is really key. And sadly, if you do have to do damage assessment and documentation, make sure you document the survivors. Obviously, you have to look at some of the legal implications for um, animals that haven't survived, and particularly if they've lost their collars or their cage cards, another sort of quick moment to promote chipping, microchipping in all of your pets. Mine are. <laughs> okay. Talking a little bit about quickly about insurance, and there's a lot of information again through AVMA. We have the Professional Liability Insurance Trust or PLIT.com. Many of you um, veterinary practitioners probably have that for your liability insurance. They also get involved with business insurance, lots of different issues to be covered, business interruption, personal property, even civil ordinance coverage. And I always wondered, what's that mean? Well, if the federal government or the state government comes in and for whatever reason uh, shuts down a particular area and your practice is in it and you cannot get your practice back open, that's a government action that basically prevents you from getting to you know, do, go back to your business. So there's part of insurance coverage there. The big trick, though, is flood insurance. And I think many of you may be aware of that. that Generally, uh, the, the standard policies do not have flood insurance, so that's something you need to consider if you're in a flood area. There is a national flood insurance program, but your community has to join that program in order for you then to be able as an individual or as a business to, to partake. So just think about those particular areas. Um, again, as far as recovery, AVMF, which is the American Veterinary Medical Foundation, similar to the ADF, also offers some disaster assistance grants. Uh, they're not very large, but they're something. And what's interesting is you can get both or either a reimbursement grant. So up to $5,000 if you have provided care for animal victims of the hurricane or any disaster. If you're out of pocket expenses, you can actually submit a, an application for a grant to be reimbursed for those out of pocket expenses. And also for your own relief grants, up to $2,000 is available to veterinary practices if you've been directly impacted. Again, it's not a lot of money granted given the cost of things, but it's something, it's something, okay? FEMA as well has a lot of resources. Obviously, I don't represent FEMA here, but please do go to their website. A lot of it is um, the www.ready.gov. That's more about the planning, planning for yourself, for your business, a lot of information about disaster planning as well as response and recovery. Um, also, if you um, have finally recovered, okay, or maybe you weren't significantly impacted, please remember that you are part of the community and you're an important part of the community. Whether you're in the medical profession, the dental, or the veterinary profession, as professionals, we are really looked upon often as mentors or as people, go-to people who kind of, we're supposed to know what we're doing, right? <laughs> well, be part of the community disaster plan. And it's not just about animal care for vets. Believe me, we have other skill sets. Donation management, volunteer coordination, uh, even setting up temporary shelters. So be part of the greater good. Um, there are lots of different areas that, in which you can participate. Even damage assessment, again, temporary shelters for animals. If people can't find a pet-friendly hotel or a pet-friendly shelter, maybe you'll be willing to take their pet for a certain period of time. I would suggest as veterinarians, please work that out way in advance so that you have a good contract or good understanding of roles and responsibilities and liability, okay? Also, just know where you fit into the whole recovery and disaster response process. What you bring to the table, all of us sitting here as professionals in the medical and veterinary and dental profession, we have lots of different business skills, management skills, not just the technical skills. So realize where we fit in. I would encourage you as well to work within the system as a disaster responder for over 10 years. Don't freelance. There's fortunately right now, there's a really good system out there. Fortunately, it's been built up over the recent decade where we do work together. We do have lots of good coordination from top down. Learn about ICS, Incident Command System. There are free modules on FEMA that can give you the basics of how you 
become a part of that process. If you want to get involved in the future, please consider your local and county animal response or human response. The American Red Cross has local and county chapters. We have what we call county animal response teams. I know here in the New York City area, they have the New York City Veterinary Emergency Response Teams, which is wonderful because you know what? Emergencies start at the local level, don't they? Emergencies are local, and then they scale up from there. So please consider being a part of any of those organizations that can really use you, even the uh, NGOs, the American Humane Association, ASPCA, et cetera. There's also state and regional level emergency response organizations, such as the state animal response team, such as VMAT, where I'm representing for AVMA, where we try to work at the state level, at that next level up. And then there are national animal response areas as well. We have national uh, veterinary response teams. Some of those actually did come into the New York City area recently to help out as augmentation for some of the pet shelters. We also have USDA Veterinary Services has a separate sort of list of standby veterinarians that can go out for other types of national emergencies. Okay. And this is just a list of the resources. Again, not exhaustive, but hopefully a good list to start with. Look again at AVMA, at FEMA, at OSHA. There's also information there for the Farm Service Administration if you need farm assistance in that case, or Red Cross. Don't forget the IRS. They're our friends, aren't they, right? Tax assistance. And then again, some of the, the uh, NGOs or the non-governmental organizations that can help you as well. All right. Um, I also listed here the name of Dr. Cheryl Aya. She is the current uh, director of the American Veterinary Medical Association Disaster Response Unit, and her email address is up there. And again, I'm here on behalf of the AVMA to offer you hopefully some useful information that you can take with you. And that's also my email address there. So please feel free to contact either one of us. Thank you. Thank you very much.